Hi, this is Rahiman Sheikh. Welcome to Fortnightly Railway Transportation Systems podcast. I am the host and railway system specialist. This podcast is primarily focused on railway experts who have vast amount of experience and contributed greatly to this amazing industry. This is not a technical seminar but focuses on feel good stories, individual journeys, their success and failures motivating younger generation to kick start their career in railways and creating a sense of pride for the railway people who devoted their lives on the most environment friendly public transportation welcome to the railway transportation systems podcast today we have the privilege of speaking with phil gaffney a distinguished figure in the global railway industry phil's extensive career spans over 5 decades beginning as an engineering student with british railways and leading to prominent roles such as operations director and managing director of hong kong mtr board member and chairman of irish rail and a senior independent advisor for crossrail his expertise has been instrumental in major projects worldwide including the lantau airport railway the octopus smart car system and the sydney metro's northwest rail link currently continues to provide valuable consultancy services through his firm Phil Gaffney Consulting Limited Phil thank you for joining us today uh, thank you for having me Rami so let's start from your early beginnings could you tell us about your early experiences as an engineering student at British Railways and how they shaped your career yeah um this was a, a five year engineering student training program in the chief s&t engineers office in glasgow uh, It was really an excellent program. Covered all aspects of S&T engineering, including two years on the track in mechanical and electrical installation uh, gangs, uh, as well as in the drawing office preparing scheme plans and wiring diagrams and testing and commissioning of, of works on site. It also included spells with the operators, permanent way and rolling stock departments. The, the program gave me a deep understanding of signals and telecoms and an appreciation of how this fitted in with the rest of the railway business. I, I truly believe that these formative years helped shape my career particularly in the leadership of a large direct workforce and in the the operation of the railway beautiful i think quite crisp Phil, but I'll deep dive more. Let's go to your Hong Kong MTR experience. During your time at Hong Kong MTR, what were some of the most challenging and rewarding projects you worked on? Well, there are so many I could mention. Uh, it was a very challenging and rewarding uh, time in my life. Um, when I joined MTR as a train control and signaling engineer in 1977, the first line had had not been brought into use yet. Um, and by the time I left in 2005, there were five operational lines. carrying 2.8 million passengers per day uh, and was deemed to be the most reliable railway in the world but, but some of the most memorable projects were as you mentioned the, the Lantau Airport railway line um, this was a dedicated line from uh, central business district Hong Kong to the new airport on Lantau Chet Markcock included in town check in and transporting of your bags as well as yourself to the airport it also had at the airport for arrival and departures you had the same level uh, interface so no lifts or escalators required from train uh, to airport Another memorable project was the replacement of the original train control system. The original system was a Westinghouse signals track circuit based system using ATP and ATO and this was replaced uh, in the late 90s early 2000s by a CBTC system provided by Alstom but based on a system developed by Martra in in France. Uh, this gave significant increased capacity it was not track circuit based it was uh, distance to go based and it, it, it gave significant increased capacity for the railway however the unique aspect of this project was that we changed the signaling system over the three lines and tr- and the whole train fleet using normal engineering hours there were no extended possessions so all this work was carried out during a four hour period every night uh, and it was you know my old boss at the time when i explained it to him said it, it was like doing open heart surgery every night but it was a, an amazing project the last one which was really again very interesting 
very challenging was introducing platform screen doors to the underground sections of the railway. We had put installed platform screen doors on the new build for Atlanta Airport Railway and then decided to in- include this in the underground sections of the operational railway. And this is the first time in the world that full height platform screen doors had been installed on an operational railway. Again, we did that during normal engineering hours, no extended possessions, and it was really quite a challenge. But it was a project which the Hong Kong public came to appreciate very, very much. Uh, and although we had made the justification for the scheme was on the basis of reduced energy costs by closing off the, the station to the tunnels and reducing the air conditioning uh, bill, the public and the politicians seen it as a major safety project. And for that reason, we, uh, we managed to uh, uh, add 10 cents on, onto the fare um, to, to help pay for it. So as you can imagine, 10 cents times 2 million passengers a day is over forever. It's quite a lot of money. So yeah. it's an interesting financial project as well. And those are two or three of the the major one. Great insights and amazing project, Phil. I'm pretty sure the Hong Kong people will be ever thankful to you for your service you have provided to Hong Kong. Thank you. I don't know if they'll remember me, but I remember that. <laughs> they will. They will. They will, Phil. And let I heard that you are a very supportive person for innovations, especially because you are from operations background in railway, which I heard. So let's talk about operational innovations. How did the implementation of the Octopus smart card system, which we just touched, revolutionize public transportation in Hong Kong? Well, the, the Octopus card system uh, is a major success for, for Hong Kong. Um, and I was involved at the very start of this and, and as a member of the Octopus board. It's interesting institutionally. The, we decided, MTR, although we led the project, it was our idea, we realised and were determined that this card would be used for all public transport in Hong Kong. Ferries, trams, the other, the heavy rail system, the light rail system, and most importantly, buses. Um, so we had to bring on board all the other public transport operators and we only the only way we could do that, although we were the driver for this and we seen the benefits, not everyone seen it that way so we had to come up with a, a, a company which we led but we were not the majority shareholder which was very, very tricky. However it worked well and the card was seen by the public to be so flexible and so innovative that we far exceeded the, the, the number of cards that were, that were in use. I think two or three years after full operation. I think the, the population of Hong Kong at the time was about 5, 5.5 million um, people. Certainly a few years after introducing the smart card, we had 8 million smart cards in circulation. Uh, so most people would have more than one card. Reason being that you could maximise your last ride bonus. So you, you'd keep cards and with the last uh, a small amount on them and then take the whole family uh, yep. from you know to Lantau at the weekend. So really, really quite a life-changing public transport uh, innovation. And then also we then seen the benefit of having so many cards, so much money on these cards that we could start introduce the use of the card for retail purchases and various other things. If you go into the, the station, you could stop off, you know, get your newspaper, get your cigarette, you know, get a coffee, do whatever you, whatever you wanted to at a convenience store or a McDonald's or, or somewhere, go into the train, onto the bus, change from bus to train, ferry, whatever, uh, and go off at the other end and, and buy something at a convenience store. So really, Amazing. really life-changing. Amazing. And very, very, it was a profitable business. And one of the interesting things, a couple of interesting things, too many people realise that the, the actual, the hardware and software system was actually supplied by an Australian company, uh, the ERG company. And Phil, I still stick with uh, MTR, but let's discuss between privatization and growth. Can you share your insights on the privatization of MTR? Yeah. And its think, impact? To put it into context, MTR was, was formed uh, as a company which was at arm's length from the Hong Kong government. Although the Hong Kong government was a single shareholder, but the Hong Kong government, to fairly significant decisions in forming MTR back in the, the, the 70s. One, that it had to operate using prudent commercial principles, and two, the MTR could determine its own fares uh, without approval from, from government. The, the workforce were employed directly by Hong Kong MTR. They were not government servants. So we always operated on a commercial basis. And we took the, the, the charge of operating with using prudent commercial principles. We took that to mean making a profit from the, 
the business, such that the original capital could be repaid over time. It became evident that to do this solely on the basis of the fair bot would be very challenging, and the capital would only be repaid after many, many years. The Hong Kong government then agreed to provide, to allow MTR to develop property above and adjacent to the railways. And, and that became, that was a, a, a game changer. So the MTR then developed this rail plus property model. So they, and we were making very good profits from property, very good profits from the railway. So it became quite a, you know, a no-brainer really that the Hong Kong government could sell down some of its shareholding um, to the equity market um, because you could look at revenue forecasts from the railway and property development uh, profits and it was a very strong, strong business case. So 5th of October 2000, um, MTR was listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. It was uh, a huge success. Uh, we sold a billion dollars worth of, of shares. I was very privileged. Uh, I was operations director at the time and I led the the IPO launch uh, roadshow in Europe, 12 cities in 10 days and quite an experience for a signaling engineer to be leading a team of merchant bankers selling a billion US dollars worth of, of shares. I don't think there's too many signaling engineers uh, have that in the career CV. So it was, it was really I, fantastic. I agree. However, as we had operated as a commercial organisation uh, since inception, there was very little change in, in the management of the company. You know, we'd always operated commercially. We were always at arm's length from government and, and that, that maintained. What it did give us, though, was a, a, a greater, a more sharpness in terms of exploiting commercial benefits of the railway. So, uh, for instance, the, the whole um, station retail, advertising, uh, telephones. We, we were the first railway in the world where um, mobile phones could be used underground on the railway. And, and we received significant uh, revenue from the, the, the mobile phone companies to achieve that. So that, that gave us a more sharpness in diversifying, I think, as a, a, a benefit from uh, privatisation. In terms of how we operated on a daily basis, no real difference. We, In some ways, it brought us closer to the public because it was something like 600,000 Hong Kong citizens became shareholders of the NTR. So not only were they critical of uh, the service performance, uh, they became critical of the share price. But th- there was then a, a stronger link with uh, with a lot of our customers. Well, great, great insights. Is this the reason for international expansion, which is uh, establishing MTR's railway business in China and Europe? Yeah, to, to a good extent, yes. The international business expansion is, is actually, that really started taking off after privatization, around about 2002. It coincided with the time when I was acting chief executive, uh, we were still looking for a, a real one. What became apparent, and the, the real plus property model, excellent model, However, it only works when you are building new extensions to the railway uh, under the rules that we operated then. So after 2002, when we opened the Chun Kuan O extension, there was no plans, for, you know, no approved plans for new extensions to the railway. So in the, looking at a 10-year forecast, if that prevailed, there became quite a black hole in the profitability and the, in the profits of the company, you know, which the shareholders and investors did not think was you know, attractive to them. So we, we developed a strategy strategy which would export our expertise using a very strong balance sheet to to expand into the international market. And we, the strategy we came up with was, was twofold. We would export a real plus property model with financial backing into China because there were many, many cities in China wanted to build metros. And that would be relatively high risk because of the property element. But we'd offset that with a low risk strategy, which was to get involved in railway franchise operations, principally in Europe, where there was a well established by this by this time in the two thousands, a relatively well established real franchise business going. That's the way we set off. Get involved in Shenzhen Metro, Beijing Metro. I, I was I led the team which negotiated the first public private partnership for Metro Line uh, Line Four in Beijing, the, the first in, in China, and that's been hugely successful. And and but I think by the end of last year was something like 12 or 13 lines in China, which MTR either owns or operates or, or, or has been involved in. Uh, likewise in Europe, you've got, you know, MTR are operating rail 
uh, rail services in, in UK and Sweden and then in the last 15 years or so it expanded into Australia where they're obviously involved in, in Melbourne and, to, and in Sydney with the North West Rail Link. So it's been a successful strategy and in the last two or three years the actual revenue generated from passenger train services overseas exceeds that of the passenger revenue service in Hong Kong And but strong caveat and I'm sure finance directors and MTR would point this out that the margins overseas are much, much, much leaner than in Hong Kong. So the profitability in Hong Kong still far exceeds that of the international business. Amazing achievement, Phil. Without leaders like you, this wouldn't have been possible. I would like to ask you a leadership question. Can you briefly tell us how did your role transition from operations director to acting CEO and then managing director of operations and business development at NTR. Yeah, yeah, I was operations director 2002 and, and the, the then chairman and chief executive, Jack Sol, uh, left and company then had an international search for a chief executive and, 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 and rightly so, we want, they preferred to have and wanted to have a, a Hong Kong Chinese person. Um, that took some time, so I was asked to act as the chief executive at that time um, and, you know, as, as I just explained, yeah, uh, that there was an opportunity then to, to to develop the international business, and during that period, that's that, that's what we did. You know, I then by the end, yeah, you know, after about a year, I, I had planned to leave. I thought it was the right time to go. However, the, the incoming chief exec asked me to to stay on. I took up the role as managing director of operations and business development, and I did that for the last three years of my time in MTR. And an amazing opportunity. So I was allowed uh, the, the the opportunity to start implementing the. Uh, international business strategy which we've just just discussed which was great however I was still responsible for the Hong Kong operation so a tough time a, a lot of travel to China to UK to Europe as well as running the business in, in Hong Kong and a huge you know a huge difference in, in, in the roles so I was still held account for five minute delays on the railway in Hong Kong although I'd be I'd be, I'd be sitting in Beijing negotiating a, a joint venture and if there was a 15 minute delay uh, in the railway service in Hong Kong, I was expected to go back down to appear before the LegCo Council and uh, explain why. So it was a very challenging time, thoroughly enjoyable. And uh, also towards the end of that period, I was asked to... The government wanted MTR and KCR, the, the heavy rail company in Hong Kong, wanted them to be. I was tasked to lead the team, which looked at the synergies that could be achieved and the savings which could be uh, gained from from such a merger. And, and that uh, that I did, and said farewell to Hong Kong in 2005. So it was a you know quite a different role in the end, an operations director or chief engineer, but a really really interesting, hugely uh, enjoyable. Yeah, I think I agree with you. Let's move from Hong. Kong to to the different countries now cross rail involvement and also Irish rail and CIE so I'm clubbing my two questions so what is your primary challenges you faced as the chair of systems expert panel and later as non-executive director for cross rail um a lot of challenges I mean I chaired the systems expert panel uh, for three years the railway cross rail spanned two regions of uh, network rail heavy rail and there was a tunnel and also a line to Heathrow Heathrow Express as well as building a new tunnel underground in, in London um, so huge integration process four or five different signalling systems three or four different infrastructure managers and a real challenge to try and bring us together uh, it has to be said the, and the other thing was that the train the train to, to operate the system was being procured separately um, by Transport for London so the train procurement did not sit within the procurement process for for the whole cross rail project. So all of these things led to a massive systems integration task. But it has to be said that when the project started, systems integration wasn't even discussed. There was no systems integration structure in place. Yeah. So as the chairman, as the systems expert panel, we had to point this out and we had to try and, within the, the major uh, constraints uh, and restraints, um, we had to try and get an, an integrated system together. Yeah. This has been a major lesson learned for many projects worldwide. Yep, I would say that in Hong and Crossrail, yeah. we were partially successful. We were partially successful. It was one of the major issues. One of the major issues was the different signaling systems, the fact that the train, the train borne control system was being provided as part of the train and therefore it was quite difficult to, to achieve that integration. You know, 
contractually, it wasn't, if you like, the cycle for the project did not start off with well-defined system requirements. Yeah. Uh, and that was a cha- challenge all the way through. We, the project also, I went onto the board as a non-exec director, the only independent, uh, in the end, I was the only independent non-executive director. Um, and when the board was stood down in 2019, I became an advisor to the Commissioner for Transport in London, Andy Byford, for the project. One of the lessons learned, major lessons learned during that time, was that the board uh, were not as well informed as they should have been in terms of the potential, the actual delays to the delivery of the program. Crosshill tunnels were built. That was a tremendous success. However, the, the, the organization, in my opinion, believed that success and, and believed they could deliver you know, no matter what. However, fitting out of the stations, the M&E works on the stations and the rail systems were a completely different challenge to building uh, tunnels underground. We were not well developed enough to do that. And that was one of the major failings. Great, great insights. Could you also briefly tell me about your involvement in the Irish Rail and CIA where you were the chairman of Irish Rail and board member of CIE? Yeah, I I became a a board member of Irish Rail in 2006 and then became chair in 2011. And at the same time, I became a board member of CIE, which is the holding company for transport, public transport in Ireland. Really, really interesting times. It was great to go back to a traditional railway. Irish Rail is very traditional, uh, very traditional structure. Uh, It was good to get back there and uh, I was able to introduce some of the lessons I'd learned in Hong Kong and elsewhere. However, it coincided with the, the world financial collapse. As my time as chairman, Ireland was in a very severe austerity program, uh, and it was very difficult to keep keep services going. Very difficult to to keep people motivated. But we achieved that. We reduced the workforce um, by necessity, but we increased, the, we improved the reliability and we improved the customer service during that time. Also, we used that time quite wisely in planning for extension, expansion of the railway when funds became available. And we're now seeing that uh, actually happen in, in Ireland now with uh, three or four major projects now uh, on the go uh, in Ireland. So it was an interesting time, a very, very tough time uh, during the, the austerity, but um, interesting and rewarding and uh, many, many excellent people uh, who are now colleagues that I, I value dearly. Wow, great insights, Phil. Can you also elaborate your contribution to the HS2 Procurement Expert Panel and the T2 Dublin Metro Link Expert Panel? Yeah, the, um, I mean, not much to say, nothing really to say about HS2. My involvement there was, was quite, quite limited uh, into one procurement, procurement expert panel. The Dublin Metro Expert Panel different. I've been involved in that for three years now. The project is awaiting planning approval, but we've got the uh, client partner engineering team on board and operations team on board. And we've just appointed the program director, Sean Sweeney, and he's coming from uh, Auckland Rail to join us as the program director. So we're excited about that. My involvement there has been to bring, to challenge the thinking, the, the client, and to bring this international best practice where we can and lessons learned from uh, from uh, from other projects, principally from Crossrail and Sydney. The Dublin Metro will look, when it opens, hopefully 10 years yeah. time, it will look very, very like Sydney Metro. It's a GOA4, automatic railway, platform screen doors, modern trains. Yeah, it will look very similar to Sydney Metro. And I've used a lot of my experience on Sydney Metro in trying to help the people in uh, in, in Dublin get to where they want to be. Uh, uh, and that is, uh, uh, up to now, has been very, really, really enjoyable. But we're coming to a very crucial time yeah. when government funding has to be made available uh, over the next year or two to, to, for, for the project to really take off. But I'm very hopeful. And again, that will be, will be life-changing in Dublin city centre to have an underground metro. Uh, traveling north to south and it will also go to Dublin Airport. That that will be again uh, quite a quite a benefit to not only Dublin traveling public but the international traveling public. I concur with that, Phil. Definitely your contribution would definitely add value to that. Let's talk about the technological advancements. The most important question of this pod, how have technological advancements in signaling and control systems impacted the railway industry over the years? Um, so I've, as you pointed out at the, uh, at the beginning, I've, I've been involved in railways for nearly 50 years. 1965 I started. Technology and, and signaling and, and control uh, um, has advanced beyond recognition in uh, and, and, and that time. And, and in particular, for, for those railways that I've been associated with, nearly all of them were involved in some you know, technical 
technology advancement during my time there. I think the major benefit that I have seen is that we are now generally operating much safer railways than was the case in my day when I started off. Absolutely clear both the technology um, and the application of that technology has led to far safer operations, both in terms of passenger railway services, but also people people delivering that service, people on uh, in, in signalling, in particular signalling and telecoms, whose access to track and safety around the track is much greater than ever it was the case back in my day. So we've seen much greater safety. We've seen the introduction of elect- electronic systems and the move away from electromechanical systems has led to much higher levels of reliability uh, than were ever the case. Uh, back in uh, in, in my day in, in places like Hong Kong and TR the levels of reliability are absolutely astounding and that is driven principally by uh, increased improved technology particularly signalling and train control however some of the things which are not so good as an industry we don't deliver that level of reliability out of the box it takes us far too long to go up the reliability growth curve. And I think that is really something that the industry has to spend much, much more time and effort in, in getting to out-of-the-box reliability, which means investment in far more extensive offline simulation and testing facilities and using those simulation and testing facilities, trusting them such that we can bring systems into service without a lengthy testing and commissioning uh, process, which is one of the the, the causes of this. uh, Projects are not being delivered as quickly as they can be, given the technology available to us. And and we really need to address that. Um, The other thing which has led to is that very few people now, because the industry has changed as well, most places, infrastructure, train operations, rolling stock operations are separated. And that together with much higher degree of specialization in the development of the new technology, principally all software-based, electronic-based. So the, you, you then have highly specialist engineers who have got a very deep understanding of the system that they're providing, but a very weak understanding of the, the whole railway system. Where does that, that system fit within the system I'm delivering? How does that fit in within the, the, the overall system? And, and so there's very few people like myself who had the opportunity of spending five years understanding the overall railway system as part of my training. And then during my career, moved from signaling engineering to operations to business and now back advising on signaling engineering. There are very few, that those opportunities are very limited now. And that's to the detriment of getting a holistic approach to uh, develop, uh, delivering systems and, and we should be able to deliver these systems quicker and much more reliably than we do and I think part of that is a lack of understanding and application of railway systems integration uh, so the technology is there we've, we've certainly benefited from the technology in terms of safety and reliability but we've not benefited from it in the, the faster uh, delivery of uh, reliable and safe uh, projects Phil great insights really I'm loving talking to you now let's Let's go to the future of railways. Based on your extensive experience, what do you envision for the future of global railway systems and infrastructure development? What I see is a continued improvement to the safe operation of railways and the safe performance of infrastructure to support those railways using, but increasingly using carbon-free technologies, carbon-free materials to achieve that. Again, we're you know, railways in some places railways are ahead of the curve some places railways are below the curve but I see that becoming something that has to happen across the industry an essential um, element of any develop, railway development I see that railways will become less and less dependent upon humans to operate them yeah. uh, particularly train operations but I see an increased involvement in humans in the delivery of higher levels of customer service, um, so I would hate to see. Uh, I'd, I'd, you know, I would like. I, I would envisage GOA four automatic operations of trains, but I'd like to see humans on station to help people move around the system. And it's getting that balance right, which I think is one of the challenges. Also, I think by using technology to bring, and it's happening, but not universally. 
and not deep enough to bring railway information, railway operations information, railway yeah. railway opportunities to travel on the railway to bringing that right into uh, into every uh, into every home, so that it becomes part of your, your life. So in, in Hong Kong, when we introduced the smart card and we had eight million of them out there, we used to talk about Mister and Mrs MTR. So and, and that's that's where we should be getting to. People around you know globally should be looking at the railway as an integral part of their life. And we've got to use technology to actually achieve that. I wish that would happen and I strongly believe we would achieve that in the future. Before I let you go, Phil, could you give us your one piece of advice to young engineers and leaders aspiring to have a significant impact in the railway industry? My, my advice is to look to the side as well as looking down. And you, you know, the ra- a railway, an integrated business, it's an integrated operation. We each have our bit to do, but we can only do that bit to the best or to the benefit of the business if we understand which other, what other people are doing and work with them to actually achieve that level of integration. So creating the best, the most sophisticated software code for a train signaling system is only part of it. That has to fit within the overall railway operation. So lift your head and look to the side and engage with your colleagues in actually delivering an integrated railway system. Amazing advice, Phil. I would love to take it. Great insights. I really loved chatting to you. Thank you, Phil, for sharing your incredible journey and insights with us today. Thank you, Raheem. Enjoyed that very, very much indeed. Thank you. I believe everyone listening to this podcast has got something to take away from today's discussion. If you like this podcast, please listen, follow and share this podcast within your network. If you believe we should be sharing your story or someone within your network, there is a railway leader who should be here sharing his or her contribution to this industry. Contact me on railwaytransportationsystems at gmail.com. Thank you for your time today. See you next fortnight. Until then, stay safe and take care of yourself.